Uh, we have been discussing about the power dissipation in CMOS circuits and uh, we also have discussed the uh, relevance of actually designing circuits with low power and the current mo uh, current era when the most of the systems are handheld, uh, the power dissipation in this device or in a circuit is very relevant and uh, to make it low power designs, we have actually looked into variety of power aware uh, system designs. We also looked into saying that what causes the power dissipation in circuits and one we figured out that there are three kinds of power, one is the dynamic power, the other is switching power or switch uh, short circuit power and the last but not the least the leakage power. In earlier technologies, uh, it has been found that typically around uh, maybe 75 percent power goes in dynamic, 20 percent goes in short circuit power and 5 percent in case of uh, leakage power. But as the advancement in technology has taken over from last uh, 10, 15 years, we went from 0.25 micron process to now almost 28 nanometer process and may soon go into 16 nanometer process. Uh, because of that, the devices have become uh, very, very small both in length and widths and uh, that has actually created some other problems, particularly the power uh, which is lost in the leakage power. And I, I last time shown you that in the 32 nanometer node or down, it may be found that the standby leakage power may be larger than the dynamic power and in that case, the major research should be done to actually control the leakage power. Now, last time we did discuss, but quickly I will show you what I said last time. This is the last slide I shown you last time. I started saying that leakage power is uh, has following contributors. For example, the first and the foremost is the reverse leakage current of the diode of a source or drain junction with the substrate. The second we discuss is subthreshold current and I had last time said that even if the device is uh, VGS is less than a VT, we are still in weak inversion and because of this state, there is a current flowing still in the between source and drain even if VGS is less than VT and this we say as subthreshold current. Now, that means, we thought the device is off, but in fact device is not fully off, it is still leaking the current. Uh, the third possible we say is the oxide tunneling current. This is essentially because as the scaling down of technologies have taken place, the oxide thickness of the insulator in MOS itself has thinned down. So much so that it is possible for carriers to tunnel through this thin oxide because of the large electric field which vertically it creates. Now, the fourth which is very relevant now uh, has occurred which is called Giddel. Uh, sorry, fourth is of course, uh, there is a possibility that since the short channels have become very, very small, very, very as I say nanometer technologies we are talking about. And in that case, the electric field at the drain end is so high because of crown uh, carrier crowding at times, uh, sorry, the current uh, field crowding at that time that carriers can get injected across the grate uh, and therefore, it is called hot carrier injections. The fourth or rather fifth is essentially occurring because what we call gate induced drain leakage. This is essentially the problem is happening is that as the source and drain uh, have a stronger doping compared to substrate, there is a large depletion layers both at the drain side as well as on the source side. Now, these large electric field uh, large depletion layer creates electric field, but even if now let us say if your gate is having a 0 bias or lower voltage, then the uh, there is an accumulation layer even if there is no inversion layer prior to inversion there is an accumulation layer which actually changes the substrate doping at the surface. Uh, and because the substrate doping is higher there, there is a excessive electric fields around the drain end. And then the, uh, because of this, there is a larger uh, current flowing between source and the substrate through this uh, inversion uh, through this accumulation layer and this is called gate induced drain leakage. Gidel is very, very relevant now because the uh, as the scale down technologies, the dopings are anyway increasing to adjust the threshold voltage. And the finally, uh, since the channel length are becoming extremely small, the source drain depletion layer width can connect to each other without having the gate voltage and that means short circuiting the source drain even without the gate, gate voltage applied we call a sponge through and it may actually create a large current because of the 
short channel a uh, short resistive path created between source and drain. So, having told that uh, this is a typical figure which essentially says the if you look at the I 1 which is nothing but the diode leakage current same way of course, will be true for this side as well. So, I 1 is the diode leakage current between substrate and the drain I 2 I 3 and I 6 are essential there are three currents one essentially is occurring simply because sub threshold current is flowing. The third is essentially because there is a possibility that Giddle currents uh, sorry Giddle current is of course, I 4 I 4 is the Giddle current I 6 sorry I 7 I 8 is essentially because of the oxide tunneling happening here and hot carrier effects and I I 3 essentially is the punch through I 6 is the punch through possibilities and I 3 may be because of drain induced barrier lowering which occurs because of the larger fields created here because of the source and drains. So, these possible currents 8 types of current which may essentially contribute to a leakage current even if V g s is less than V t. These are the numbers which I have given and these are the things which I already explained to you. Now, obviously, therefore, one can see what affects the leakage the body effect change in substrate body bias affects the threshold voltage and so is the leakage current. We shall go into this little detail a few minutes later. The second uh, issue which is occurring in the lower uh, channel devices in particular and with the technologies as lower the 32 nanometers or even lower. We have a because there is a VDD is not scaling so much the higher the VDD we apply uh, the source and drain depletion layer widths are very very large and uh, because they are very large the bulk charges which creates the threshold voltage expression we shall see later. The bulk charges are already present even without VGS which means that to create an inversion channel now you will require smaller amount of threshold smaller amount of VGS to create a inversion channel below because already part of the depletion layer is providing you the bulk charge. This that means the because of the larger VDD one sees reduction in threshold voltage. And the finally, of course, uh, all the currents except the tunneling part currents they are exponential depending on temperatures and therefore, larger the temperature uh, leakage currents are always higher. Please remember in most of the small short channel devices of less than 45 nanometers the major worry right now is the rise in temperatures as we already seen in case of uh, earlier uh, lectures. The temperature may rise to as large as uh, nuclear power reactor power or you know, rocket nozzles. So, the minimum even what we call self heating experiments uh, we did uh, or people have done shows that the normal temperature on a chip is not 27 degree centigrade as one looks at it is essentially around 70 75 degree centigrade and which essentially enhances the leakage current proportionately in exponential term. And we already discussed last time to great extent we said larger the uh, power or larger is the uh, larger is the CMOS technology generation as we reduce there is a temperature rise in the junctions. Uh, you can see this is even for 90 nanometers we are already at the very high end uh, this is uh, CMOS ship is increasing its temperature and uh, because it is a normalized temperature. So, it is 4 times 5 times now already and it lower the technology it may become more than 10 times. Now, this means that if I want to dissipate this much power or rather uh, if I want to keep temperature below 70 degree or something like this so something 3 or 3 and half. So, I must remove the heat and that essentially what we call the thermal resistance of the substrate as well as that of the packaging has to be so adjusted that the temperature does not rise junction temperature does not rise high enough more than 70 degrees. Now, uh, having told that there is a leakage problem at the particularly for uh, sub threshold or uh, some nano sub 45 nanometer technologies we want to know can we reduce this power leakage power by circuit technique. One is of course, device technique which we have discussed. Once we have a devices made chips are made there is nothing much we can do. However, during design and during working of the chip can we actually reduce the leakage current. So, we now go for the area which we talk about leakage current control by using circuit techniques. 
Now, what essentially is this word I am talking about is the fact there are a number of ways. A sleep transistor is one method of doing reducing the leakage current, leakage power. The other is dual threshold voltage CMOS. Instead of dual, it can be multi threshold voltage CMOS as we may see later. Uh, dual is a word initially we used, but then it was found that you can have a number of devices have different thresholds. Then there can be also a variable threshold voltage because we can as continuously vary the threshold voltage, which is also possible. Then there is a technique of body bias transistors uh, by putting a substrate bias, either reverse, mostly reverse bias or sometime forward bias, we can actually change the threshold voltage and which essentially controls the leakage currents. The one of course, the foremost way which can reduce the all kinds of power whether it is dynamic short circuit or even the leakage which is into power supply current into power supply voltage. So, obviously, in leakage power to reduce power supply voltage must go down. So, if you scale it then obviously, power goes down. So, is it possible in circuits to actually reduce the voltages uh, particular voltages at particular times. So, that the net power reduction is possible when certainly you are in a standby mode, it is not in a active mode. Then of course, there is another method which has been tried successfully to many extent is transistor stacks and we will look into this multi ratio transistor stacks as one way of reducing the leakage power. And of course, if you have a technology possibilities already existing with you that you can modify the technology or rather at least during designs you need not use all transistors with the same minimum channel lengths you can have larger length devices and we have already seen short channel effects occur only and only if the device, the dimension of the device is within less than say 100 nanometers or something I mean the short channel effect is very strong. Though it starts around 0.25, but the effects are very, very strong when it goes below 90 nanometers. So, if you have a device which has a larger lengths, uh, channel lengths, probably much of the problems can be solved. However, the effect of larger channel length will immediately go in the increasing of propagation delay and therefore, reducing the speed. So, can we now adjust the channel length devices where the speed is not a criteria, what we call the critical paths. So, one these are the techniques which we will use it from the circuit side to some extent from the device side, but mostly from the circuit side and we shall like to see how this uh, leakage power can be controlled. Now, before we go to sleep transistors, uh, before we go to the more details about how it occurs, I may quickly go through the list which I talked to you. Uh, one method of reducing the leakage, uh, why is the leakage occurring from the power supply to the ground and if the devices are of normal lower threshold. Please remember normal transistors have to have lower voltage, lower threshold voltage because we want to have a higher speeds. Now, for higher speed if you keep low Vt, the leakage is proportional in some sense inversely proportional to threshold voltage value. Larger the threshold, smaller is the leakage, we know that. So, because of that we now provide this, uh, additional hardware, we say okay, there are 1 p channel transistor like a dynamic system, we have a 1 p channel transistor and 1 n channel transistor, these are high area, high W by L transistors which has a higher thresholds by design and uh, they are given a signal sleep and sleep bar and we will look into this specifically when we talk about sleep transistors. Basically, you can think when the sleep is 0, uh, p channel device conducts and when the sleep is 0, sleep bar is 1. So, in n channel conducts and therefore, and since these are very large W by L transistors, uh, the voltage here and here is not very different, voltage here and here is not very different and therefore, a circuit when in active mode, uh, it behaves like a normal VDD VSS supplied here and here and circuit can function at high speeds. But in a standby mode, when you are not operating by program, one can make sleep bar 0 and sleep 1, both P channel and N channel can be cut off and during this cut off since there are higher threshold, the leakages through these are very, very small and therefore, the currents through this circuits will also be small and therefore, the leakage power can be minimized. Uh, lower leakage as I said, higher thresholds. Disadvantage of course, one can see once I said larger size devices and there is some finite drop across both P channel and N channel. Obviously, there will be smaller VDD and smaller uh, larger VSS here 
which means there will be reduced voltage swings. Of course, this can be minimized, but there still will require higher penalty on the size itself, because if size is larger, the area is larger. And of course, that is since your power supply voltage may change to some extent swing is smaller, the drive current available from this actual logic will be little smaller. So, this is very popular technique. However, these are its own advantages and disadvantages. We will come into it little more detail in the latter part. The other, I uh, will just first go through the slide and then talk about the theory behind. The other technique is of course, you can have uh, transistors, which you think are the critical paths. That means, we are slower and you want to improve the speed. Uh, we can have those transistors in the critical path as having a lower thresholds. Whereas, other areas where the speed was not so important anyway data has to wait for somewhere to reach those path need not run faster. And therefore, in those cases the transistor can have higher VTH and if those transistors are higher VTH please take from me in an off state they will provide lower leakages. To create this uh, different VTH technology wise you will have to do another mask that means, an extra implant step. This extra one step creates one mask plus additional uh, process steps, which in a way it is said it cost a million dollars. The third possibility, uh, as I say I will go to the theory a little later, but quickly look into it. If you see clearly, you have a substrate. In a mass transistor, substrate normally is grounded or either connected to source. But in the case here, if I have a substrate bias and right now shown here say for a p substrate negative bias, it can be even forward bias, but at least negative bias. Then if I apply negative bias, there will be a depletion layer here initially created between source drain and source to the substrate because of the applied negative bias. Now, this larger this essentially larger depletion layer at the source and drain end will require smaller gate voltage to create an inversion channel, which essentially means that threshold voltage of a back bias device or body bias device will be smaller and those transistors will therefore, start acting at lower threshold and therefore, higher speeds. Oh, sorry, I mean the other way, uh, since uh, forward bias will reduce the threshold and reverse bias will increase the threshold, forward bias will improve the speed and reverse bias will actually increase the uh, threshold and therefore, please remember additional charge means addition larger V t, lower charge in the bulk will have lower V t. So, when you have a forward bias, the charges are smaller at the source and drain, therefore, 3 V t goes down threshold voltage is, uh, reduces and therefore, one says that essentially you have a uh, faster circuits. So, either FBB or RBB can be tried to modulate the threshold shear and because of that one can have. There is a biggest disadvantage one sees in technology to create such thing you need to require separate wells in the CMOS there are really twin wells you may have third wells and sometimes the four wells as well. The bias circuitry will require additional uh, area which you have to give and since you have to create a bias control circuit you need additional pins. Okay. And what we see delta i of change in off current to the main main of current is proportional to e to the power 1 minus the gamma which is called double coefficient sorry it is the back body coefficient into delta V s p. So, change in this this is of course, threshold volt uh, k t by q slightly confusing, but it is essentially thermal voltage k d by q. So, depending on the V s b value, I can change the off current that is the idea behind body bias transistor. So, either V s b can be positive or negative and depends on the way by I bias and therefore, I can change the ratio of I of change in I of at my will. The third possibility of reducing the leakage current is supply voltage scaling has two fold advantage, which we always know dynamic power goes as V d d square. So, there is no question of uh, thinking that if power supply voltage is reduced, the dynamic power is going to be reduced because it is follow square law. Now, we look at the leakage power, it is nothing but V d d into leak power I current I leak and if I can reduce I leak as I just did, uh, I find there is another if we have a we reduce the V d d, then one says that the double coefficient we know double co, double drain induced barrier lowering occurs because of a large V d s uh, available to you. 
if your VDS is smaller because of VDD is smaller. So, obviously, double co coefficient goes down, drain induced barrier loading is go going down and because of that threshold voltage is actually uh, can be adjusted which becomes higher and if that becomes higher this becomes smaller and therefore, one can improve the leakage current leakage power reduction or we can improve the leakage power uh, consumption as well as we can reduce the dynamic power if I scale. Uh, scale down supply voltage, but the fact remains that there this or whatever scale law we are following as per what Moore thought, we are unable to uh, scale down supplies in the same node scaling as 0.7 times and because of that the fields are very high and the double coefficient is not very low. Okay. However, as soon as I say it increases the threshold voltage, the current available to me which is called I on to I off on state currents or active mode currents increases decreases and therefore, the speed goes down. The fourth possibility and as I say I will come back to these each of them once again individually. Uh, here is an interesting case, if you have a single transistor and then you break into uh, them into a series combination the way I am explaining is that two transistor in series is essentially has the if you have same channel length then one can say each have w you can see if these are to be series that means, 1 upon w is equal to 1 upon w 1 plus 1 upon w 2. So, if I have 2 w here 2 w here uh, by L then actually it is 1 w by L together. So, a single transistor w by L can be actually changed into 2 W by L 2 series transistors and uh, now we can see from here that if the leakage current is flowing not necessarily if this is a drain end not VDD. If the leakage current flows through down even when the gate voltage is at 0 then or you are near sub threshold value slightly higher, but not larger than V T. Then one can see from here since the current is flowing uh, N 2 source is grounded and therefore, the, there will be a voltage drop across VDS of this N2 transistor or N2 N1 whatever number I gave later, and this voltage will rise. And if this voltage rises, there are a lot of interesting effect it will give it to N1, and particularly it will increase the threshold voltage of N1. We shall see this little detail later. And if I increase the threshold voltage of N1, the leakage current through N1 can be smaller, has to go down and therefore, the leakage power will go down and we shall look into this little detail as I come down. One can see from here in this case uh, I del change in off current to the net off current can be proportional to exponential of I off into R off, R off is the off current is the resistance in the off state of this transistor N 2 into 1 plus gamma, gamma is called back bias coefficient and eta is essentially the double coefficient. So, one can see from here that I can have smaller off current provided I can adjust my values of the uh, uh, VTs of N 2 transistors much more strongly. So, that the double effect is lowered and if the double effect is lowered for N 1 we shall see that we will reduce the leakage power. This is called stack effect a very very important method and we shall see in real circuits you need not divide your say one transistor into two. This is only to show you the point I am saying that if there is a series transistor the leakage current can be lowered because of the double coefficient reducing. Now, this is the expression more details this is the uh, this is the node voltage V x here at this point. So, if I see the expressions for I 1 which is proportional to 10 to the power delta which change in gate voltage, change in the subset bias voltage, change in the drain voltage, this is the double coefficient, this is the back bias coefficient, all three put together this is the gate voltage change, S is called sub threshold slope. Okay. The current through upper and lower transistors are given by this expression using the same expression here. This is actually with you can see it is de described for the width of the lower transistor, width of the upper transistor and you solving this because these currents are equal in the two transistors, one gets what will be the uh, intermediate node voltage V x and one can see if you have a larger V x the double coefficient goes down and therefore, threshold rises. To improve V x one can see from here eta has to be larger, 
S has to be larger, uh, not 60 millivolt per decade, it should be larger. You should also have larger uh, upper transistor should have larger width compared to lower transistors. If we do all this, obviously one can see from here that I can increase V x and uh, correspondingly if I find the value two single to this we get a typical ratio of 10 to power u is called universal constant which is given by from expression from this. So, I can figure it out what should be the size ratio of the w by l s of the upper and lower transistors and once I get to that value I will be able to adjust my Debel coefficient and therefore, the threshold increase and therefore, reduction in leakage currents. The fifth possibility is actually that if I already said it depends on the channel lengths, threshold voltage is a function of channel length, this is called V t roll off. As you reduce the channel length, this is a old slide, but does not matter, this can be further extended down to 45 30 nanometers. So, V t further goes down. This roll off of V t essentially means that uh, if the uh, threshold voltage goes down, the leakage current will go up. And therefore, somehow we must see that instead of using a short channel or a very small channel devices, at least for the AL circuit transistors which are do not have speed pressure that means, they are not in critical paths, their threshold can be higher and to improve their threshold one possibility is that for almost all possible data in which those transistors will not be in the critical path those transistors can be assigned larger channel lengths and therefore, larger threshold voltage and because of that change in off current will be adjusted corresponding. So, it will have lower leakage correspondingly. So, I repeat the basic idea in all the techniques I am suggesting is to improve your threshold voltage uh, whichever way you can for the transistor and larger the threshold voltage the corresponding sub threshold slopes increases and because of that also the Debel coefficient is smaller and because of that the off current starts reducing uh, which in essentially is constituted by sub threshold current which is becomes smaller in this case. So, before I go to summarize what I said let me let me go back again whatever I said so far I will re, re talk about the same thing once again. The first thing first effect we say when you stack the transistors. Okay. Now, here is a NAND gate which is two input NAND gate as an example shown here. I have a power supply, I have a ground, I have two p channel devices in parallel for a NAND operation which has inputs A and B, I have two n channel transistor in series which has inputs A and B and this is of my output for the NAND gate. And this voltage which I am talking is the intermediate node voltage V m. Now, let us take when A and B are 0. So, obviously, these are on and the output is going high as the NAND function wants. However, M 2, M 1 are switched off as we thought think so. Since we thought that M 1, M 2 are switched off, they are really in ideal case there should not have been any current, but we have just discussed that there are three uh, many amount possibilities of current leakage through M 1, M 2 even when V j s is less than V t or close to V t. One sees this path m 2 m 1 the leakage flows through. So, there is a leakage path even if V g s is less than V t. Now, what happens due to stacking of n MOS? Uh, we have just discussed this transistor m 1 and m 2 which are n channel transistors at node m there is a intermediate volt voltage V m which is essentially occurring because of I r drop across this. I leakage into R off of this will give you a voltage here V m. So, V m is occurring because there is a lower transistor and the upper transistor there is a current flowing in the leakage current flowing which results in please remember since the current flow is like this, this potential is always larger than the ground which means V m is positive. Now, what happens if V m is positive and it leads to three major effects. Okay. So, let me discuss about those three effects. For the transistor 2 in my please remember I am having this as 1 and this as 2 I repeat I have this lower transistor as named m 1 and the upper as m 2. 
So, in those cases the V g s 2 that is for the input a V g s V g s 2 is nothing but V g 2 minus V s 2 which is essentially equal to V g 2 minus V m. But since we are keeping V g 2 very small close to 0. So, I, I, we assume the worst case 0, 0 minus V m that means the V g s 2 is minus V m. Now, we know sub threshold current of m 2 will be smaller if the uh, V g s is smaller small my negative value. And since sub threshold current of m t reduces um, obviously, the net current uh, net leakage current will reduce. So, the first and the foremost simple thing has happened that the V g s effect has taken place V g s has reduced to minus value and because of that m 2 transistors have much smaller leakage and in a circuit only one current can flow if the m 2 transistor have a smaller leakage m 1 also can flow the same current and no more. Now, the second effect which is equally true for this if you look at the bulk bias which I have not shown here there is a bulk sitting here this B which is the bulk of this n channel transistor. So, between bulk and source of this n channel m 2 there is a voltage now appearing 0 assuming that I actually ground the substrate then there is a minus voltage is again occurring as the reverse bias uh, voltage is occurring at the substrate which is equal to minus V m and we know any reverse bias enhances the threshold voltage and since the reverse bias enhances the threshold voltage uh, V t of m 2 increases V t or V t h whichever I think I sometimes said h sometimes V t, but normally I say V t h of m 2 is enhanced and we know larger the threshold voltage the leakage currents goes down. We have just done the exponential that expressions which shows that the leakage current reduces if V t s are larger. So, there are two effects the first of course, is I say because V g s effect we say second is back bias effect and third which is not uh, as simple as trivial like this third of course, is if you look at the drain to source voltage of same transistor m 2 it is V d 2 minus V s 2. So, it is V d 2 minus V m since V m is positive uh, the V d s 2 is now smaller since V d s 2 is smaller obviously, the the effect due to the drain which is essentially because of the which say drain induced barrier lowering drain induced barrier lowering will go down because your V d s has gone down. If d bulk coefficient has gone down by the same expression which I wrote earlier the threshold voltage rises which means larger the V m you get whatever way three of the reasons I said in either case the threshold voltage will rise and increase of threshold voltage of N 2 will M 2 will actually reduce the leakage currents. So, one can see from there that the leakage power due to sub threshold current can be minimized simply by saying stacking the two devices and in the NAND functions this is natural two of the transistor will always occur in series and because of that for worst case inputs of 0 0 one will see the smallest current going through it. Now, one can see from here in case the uh, situation is that one of the transistor n, n, n 2 is 1 and L. So, you may require at, uh, actually breaking of the n 1 transistor into 2 series transistor in of bits w and still create the stack effect. The net difficulty will be larger area and therefore, probably some penalty you will pay for reducing the leakage power. Now, other technique I discussed dual threshold I said dual threshold is an example uh, is a specific example multiple threshold techniques. Now, threshold can be varied by number of ways one of course, is by what uh, what we call as change in channel doping. Now, one can see from here uh, I have given for you the I re recapitulate for you the expressions the threshold voltage of n channel or a mass n p channel mass transistor is phi m s plus minus 2 phi f minus q ox by c ox minus q v by c ox where 
5 ms is the metal semiconductor or poly semi dope poly semiconductor work function difference. 5 f is called the Fermi potential which is k t by q l n n b by n i it is plus for p substrate and minus for n substrate where n b is substrate doping. The q ox is a fixed positive charge these days we are controlling extensively. So, minus q ox by c ox term is not so dominating, but it is still existing. So, it is called the fixed charge density q ox is fixed charge density. C ox absorbs is oxide capacitance per unit area which is epsilon ox by T ox where epsilon ox, ox is oxide permittivity and T ox is the oxide thickness. Please remember this epsilon can be different from different dielectric uh, insulators. High k dielectrics will have larger epsilon ox and therefore, T ox can be proportionally increased to create the same C ox effect. And the finally, the bulk charges prior to the threshold is q n b x d max, x d max essentially the maximum depletion width, which if you wish I can write an expression for the step junction at least kind of approximation. I can write x d max is under root of twice k s epsilon naught upon q n b substrate concentration into 2 phi f, where 2 phi f is the twice the Fermi potential. Of course, if you increase the reverse bias, it will become 2 phi f plus V s b and therefore, it will increase the depletion layer and therefore, increase the bulk charge. And in the threshold expression, if you see, if all of it you see the expression, uh, this increases with doping, this increases with doping and therefore, larger the doping, larger is the threshold and because it is a root value typically q t h is directly proportional to increase in root of n b. So, if you change the doping of the substrate or near the channel, I am I am I can assure you that I can increase the uh, threshold voltage. So, this is exactly the first technique we say we can have different transistors have different doping. You remember this is additional masking going on, additional cost going on but all critical paths will have lower thresholds and non critical paths will have higher thresholds and they can be adjusted through the dopings on those transistors. The second possibility is the V t can be changed by C ox value and since C ox is epsilon ox by T, T ox the threshold voltage is proportional to T ox and since as of now T ox is reducing because of this change threshold is reducing. So, change in threshold can be adjusted by this. So, you can have transistors which have multiple oxide thicknesses of the gate. Larger oxide thicknesses will have larger thresholds, thinner oxide thicknesses will have thinner threshold, uh, smaller thresholds. So, one can keep as I say the theory is again and again the same. We say it is assign lower threshold to transistors in critical path and assign higher threshold to a bear which are not so much speed dependent. So, in any case those transistors which have higher threshold will lead to lower leakage currents. The other possibility we say is called substrate by multiple body bias. We already seen the bias effects. Now, here is an another technique which we say okay, you can have multiple body bias. We know the threshold voltage with the back body bias uh, if you apply it to the substrate bias positive or negative generally negative. We can see that the threshold voltage in any substrate bias is 0 bias threshold voltage plus gamma times which is called the back bias coefficient or body bias coefficient V s b plus 2 phi f minus 2 phi f where phi f is the Fermi potential k t by q l n n a by n a or n d by n i. So, one can see larger the V s b value particularly negative value that means the plus added to this one can see from here V t will rise. On the contrary, if this is negative value, this will reduce the V t. So, by forward biasing or reverse biasing, I can change my V t corresponding to V t o value, initial value and accordingly can assign V t for different transistors. So, now you decide which transistors you should have larger thresholds. Uh, apply larger reverse bias, you apply forward bias, smaller forward bias or even zero bias wherever you require lower thresholds. And in that case, you have 
you can even have multiple body bias for different speeds requirements and one can create number of ETs uh, for different transistors to far require. But this is something very crucial because if you do this way, it is so much data dependent that every time for a different data, someone has to do adaptively that technique to control and probably that is what the last I will show you that the end of the day the control will be more adaptive rather than fixed uh, controls. Okay. Possibility of using multi threshold CMOS is known and is called empty CMOS. Here is an example shown here to you. You have a P channel sleep transistor correspondingly you have N channel sleep transistor and both have higher thresholds and we already said higher threshold means lower leakage currents. Then there is additional circuitry of P channel and N channel which is kept here which all are high threshold some kind of a logic which is can be turned on this resistance can be adjusted uh, because there are multiple thresholds and one can create a typical R across this in fact by putting corresponding zeros and ones. Now, what happens when the sleep is 0, sleep bar is 1, both N channel and M n and M p which are P channel and N channel sleep transistor they are turned on and since their area is large, uh, large area transistor W is very large, they are also higher thresholds. There is uh, larger area means larger W means smaller resistance. So, we actually create for this logic which is the real logic which you are using a VDD which is essentially called virtual VDD, okay, VDD V and that is essentially VDD minus drop across the sleep transistor. Similarly, there is a ground or VSS voltage which is virtual ground voltage which is again the this minus this much. So, now I have figured out that I can change of course, depending on the size and uh, we threshold I adjust, these voltage drops can be minimal, they can be as close to V D and V S depending on the sizing you do correctly. However, all said and done, this CMOS can have then adjusted V D D V and V D. When the sleep goes to 1 and sleep bar goes to 0, uh, these voltages are anyway available because of the drops across this and now this CMOS logic functions with virtual VDD and virtual VSS and therefore, in the active mode you have a slightly lower VDD slightly higher VSS for the device. So, it may reduce speed a bit okay, because your swings are smaller, but it will certainly reduce the leakage current when the sleep is on. That means, when you are not actually using the logic sleep can actually reduce the leakage currents. In nutshell, what we will say is disadvantages of this empty CMOS is it requires larger areas we have already said and to some extent it reduces the performance speed goes down. Okay. We are just now discussed because the swing is smaller. So, there is a reduction in speed. Now, modification of so called multiple threshold CMOS is called variable VTH CMOS. It is similar as what we did just now just not having the uh, sleep transistors, we can also have back bias also available to you. We, in an active mode, the back bias is normally set to 0 and in the case of uh, uh, standby mode, uh, back bias is given highest reverse bias and therefore, the threshold of those transistors remains smaller in case of active mode, but can increase when the back bias is reverse bias because threshold rises, double coefficient goes down and because of that the leakage current goes down. So, the problem is if I have a variable threshold which I can do by biasing, I can have different reverse biases for different transistors and therefore, I can adjust the leakage current differently or essentially if I connect it with my uh, empty CMOS additionally with this then there is an advantage that I can have a sleep mode along with this back bias and two together probably can minimize the leakage current and can probably continue to have higher speeds in the active modes. So, this is way of doing. So, dual threshold is also among the multiple or variable threshold. If you only choose two values of threshold, you say it is a dual threshold system. 
if you use multiple as we have done there empty CMOS and if you have a variable then you say it is variable C v VT CMOS. All these are essentially similar basically we are doing two techniques one is using sleep transistors the other is using back bias and if you do this together we have now a control on the leakage power. I just now said to you that uh, to do this different data will have a different transistor on and off situation. So, the critical path may not be all the time same for all kinds of data in a data path particularly if you are looking a processor uh, you know with 64 bit inputs available to you uh, a design has cannot be a for a fixed threshold. Yeah, if you keep a fixed threshold on an average power leakage power will go down, but the better technique uh, which essentially is now followed in the most processor like ARM and also in new Intel processors which are trying to reduce the low power or even the um, uh, six to, uh, 686 equivalent from the AMD all these are low power processors or low standby power in particular, but low power processors. And since the effort all across the world is to reduce low power, the technique which is now being adopted from the based on whatever I discussed so far is called adaptive biasing. The most common method which was first tried way back is called dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. We know that dynamic power is proportional to V d d square and dynamic power is also proportional to the clock frequency at C v square alpha C a C effective V d d square into f. So, if dynamic power increases with f and also increases square of V d d. So, one is quite clear that of course, I would not like to reduce f because clock frequency I want to improve because I want to have higher performance. If f is not the not to be scaled down then dynamic power is only this, but reducing V d c I of course, will reduce leakage power also, but we know we if you reduce V d d threshold can also be changed through a double coefficients. Okay. Now, how do we this is the technique which we apply. So, we say two closed loops uh, are available in control one in the DVFS system direct uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. The one is dynamic voltage control. So, depending on the data requirement and the power you are setting up, the voltage can be scaled down okay, or scaled up. So, it is called DVC loop. The dynamic frequency control in which the speed which you have already assigned f is fixed for you. So, it actually finds for given voltage the speed for that speed even calculates what voltage is required goes back and keeps doing the two loops. So, typically uh, in nutshell I can say there are few things in few steps in st this control may be 1, 2, 3 I will say few of them not I am not giving full details they are available in many papers of recent origin of 2009, 10, 11, 12 last 3, 4 years. The DFC monitors chip activity. So, what is frequency after all it decides how when the data is different how much 1, 0 transitions are taking place. Since it finds out the uh, chip activity, so it decides the frequency to work at. Now, if you decide frequency to work at then the DVC that is the dynamic voltage control loop gets this information and which then allows V d d to change to corresponding to that frequency and the condition that it actually meets at least the critical part delay which is your slowest path. Now, if that meets for this voltage change which will happen this delay is again fed back to DFC and again the frequency it finds out from the activity and till the two loops get stable for a one value of V d d and f you automatically the system will work at some lower V d d and a given speeds. So, this was the technique which was quite popular. However, please remember the cost here is there are two loops here and therefore, little hardware cost and time it will slightly slow down because it has to go through two at least three or four times in the loop two loops to adjust to its value. And the clock frequency therefore, has to be reduced because it has to happen within that. Now, we have a other technique which is similar to what 
we said just now. So, we say it is called dynamic voltage squaling okay, d v s. Now, in this dynamic voltage scaling, we have a single loop of the voltage v d d is adjusted for speed given speed is for fixed. So, v d d is just adjusted and voltage frequency relation how do we know then? Then what do we do is instead of online doing the frequency power supply uh, readjustment, we actually create a lookup table initially okay? and for both voltage and frequencies V D D and frequency values. And as I change the V D D, I look I go into the lookup table and find what is the frequency I am operating. And using this technique, we can probably uh, arrive at a reasonable value of V D which will have given frequency requirements. Now, this is called DVS, which is till date very commonly used technique for adaptive power biasing. Okay. Please remember this voltage is for two ways, one is the voltage we are giving it to power supply, and the other voltage is into the back bias. So, both voltages are talked about, so I am only giving in one word both back bias as well as the power supply voltage are actually modulated as per the frequency requirements. Finally, uh, there is a new not really new last 3 4 years may be it is a dynamic voltage and threshold scaling. Now, it is an improved version of what we just talked about d v s that is direct dynamic voltage scaling as it can be achieved at why this was tried that in this technique the volt V d d also changes the threshold. Using the lookup table, we know what voltages are required for substrate bias as well as for V d d to get the frequency of operation and for those voltages we know thresholds are varying. So, you adjust your threshold for leakage power. Okay. For those you figure out what frequency range you can attain and for this how much voltages you should apply between substrate bias and V d d. Of course, this is again a loop system you need to go it is a large hardware it is called a power management unit, which essentially creates uh, different VDDs, different voltages and, diff and therefore, allow you to have different thresholds at different points dynamically depending on the data as well as the architecture one uses. The biggest advantage of this algorithm DVTS algorithm which does this, uh, you need a small processor to do this or small controller unit to do this, but if you achieve that that gives something great advantage, because it is then becomes independent of technology node. This technique can be applied for almost any kind of technology you go from 45, 32, 28 or 22, 16. So, this is more likely of course, whenever things are very good you have extra additional hardware and the catch there is the cost of or the power dissipation in this additional control hardware should not exceed the power you are trying to save in the whole hardware otherwise if that happens then the whole purpose gets defeated. So, having shown you a variety of techniques circuit techniques to reduce this leakage power as well as to see reduction in dynamic power. Please also feel that this short circuit power is also proportional to V g s minus V d d minus V t and also proportional to this W by L of n channel to p channel ratio. So, one figures out that the short circuit current or short circuit power can be also minimized if the threshold rises. So, short circuit power is not separately controlled if you adjust your V d d or you increase your threshold then in either case both dynamic power and switching power can go down. Of course, catch there is there is something to see that the rise and fall of the input pulse should be fast enough compared to the propagation delay, which of course, is a technology uh, which of course, is the uh, device dependent phenomena, which is essentially decided by the full threshold uh, technology control. Okay. So, coming back in a shell what we can say if we are designing deep sub micron that is below 45 or 65 nanometers, we are forced to scale down voltages in interest of device reliability and power with supply voltage being reduced threshold voltage is also needs to be reduced as currents in the function of gate drive. The threshold voltage cannot be arbitrarily reduced to increase current drive since the device must have good turn off characteristics. 
The other possibility of worry which essentially one sees in turn off is uh, a parameter sub threshold swing is defined as the efficiency of a device to turning on to off is called sub threshold swing or slope s which can be given as 2.3 k t by q 1 plus c j by c ox, where c j is the junction capacitor and source to drain, source drain to substrate, c ox is oxide capacitance. Typically, this S is 60 millivolt per decade of voltages, say millivolts, 60 millivolt per decade of current change. Uh, one can see from here, if I want faster turn on to turn off ratio, I must have S larger and if that occurs, uh, one has to have some better device to, because otherwise the short circuit currents will be larger in the case, because turn off to turn on is not very fast. This is called, please remember sub threshold, uh, this larger is also means that the sub threshold current actually also is reduced at lower voltages and therefore, the leakage power further goes down. So, this is another issue where one has to worry about in your DV, DVFS or DVS or DV, DVTS, either of the regimes one must take care of in our uh, algorithms, how to adjust this S values. Uh, if we lower thresh threshold too extremely, the device will exhibit severe leakage currents at V g s equal to 0, we have just discussed this. However, we must keep the threshold at or below one fourth of the supply voltage in order to maintain acceptable current rise, because on current is also required. So, you cannot reduce too much or you cannot increase too much, because if you want drive which is on current, then you must have some amount of V g s minus V t mean available to you. The leakage current model, we have not earlier, uh, I have given you that expression, but a simpler model now I give to you is I leakage is 10 microamp per micron into width of the transistor into 10 to the power V t threshold by 95 millivolt. Now, what essentially is I am trying to say that by adjusting the widths of the transistors, uh, one probably can have and threshold voltages, one can have both threshold voltage as well as the uh, width one can adjust the leakage currents. This is how you, you will require these models in your algorithms. So, I thought I should provide you some models. Uh, in case of logic where we are examining more complex block of logic rather than simple inverters, let us say for the case of two input NAND which is not very complex, but complex uh, which is com much, much complex than in inverters. Uh, there are four possible input combination even for two input NAND gate 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 and for each of these we can examine the amount of leakage current that flows and is assigned in effective gate width, because for the worst case uh, we must find what should be the effective W which corresponding to a leakage current of the, which logically one can express as transistor logic number of transistors in, in this case is two, four transistors, two input sorry n is number of this this is 2, this is 4, this is a actually derived from like actual expressions, uh, actual graphs, this is a fit function system. So, one can see from here the width of the logic is proportional width of device by this kind of expression. So, adjust in your series combinations the correct widths, so that you can have uh, relatively good drive current at the same time you may have lower leakage currents. Particularly for I O drivers, we can use the logical effort technique to go into the chain of them, but if you are using a single driver by similar arguments for n channel and p channel device operating a factor, buff, which buffer is called the ratio of capacitor high to low, one can find the width of this proportional to how many pads you have, what is the actual lengths drawn from the this to the device and how many stages you are going through for this uh, buffer factor. Okay. So, I O design is very, very difficult designs, though it is said very trivially here, but the one can see from here the at least the input and output buffers consumes a very large amount of power. So, many a times in our hurry to design a circuit, we keep forgetting that there will be a huge loss of power at the two ends at the input and output and one must take care much more than the normal circuit design in this case, so that the net power is minimized. There is another issue which is coming into clock drivers, the powers uh, if you are too long a clock this, then you are putting a lot, lot of capacity loads, so dynamic power is very large. So, the R c time constant of an interconnect through which the clock is moving 
has to be so adjusted and it should be at the highest layer of metal layer in the case of normal technology. The maximum clock frequency which is allowed should be proportional and so you figure out for that driver what should be optimal and channel width so that it can give the re required clock, clock and you must always create H tree, H tree for the case of clock distributions. This all, all these are shown you to somehow to reduce the dynamic power in the case of additional circuits, which normal circuit designers at times do not realize that they may be the ones who may actually create large power dissipations. The other technique as I said, uh, where the limitations are coming, we have said that if you reduce VDD everything goes well fine. So, here is something which one must look into uh, before we do VDD reduction. The cycle time which is nothing but the length of the device uh, which is uh, logical or not length it is a logical depth that is ch in a chain of logic is called logical depth 1, 2, 3 if there is 3 gates are driven by each other then it is called 3 depth of 3. So, L d is the depth of logic C average is the average capacitance seen uh, V d is power supply and on current which essentially T cycle means the period of this to one transition to go is 1 upon f clock. C average is average capacitance of the load. So, one can see the T cycle is proportional to inversely proportional to V d d if I substitute correspondingly because we know ion is proportional to V d d square. So, if I see T cycle is this. So, obviously, if you reduce V d d the uh, that you want to have a low voltage design the first effect is your speed is going to be lower because your delay is going to increase do what you. Okay. So, the first thing when we said that you must do some kind of adaptive is simply for this reason because reduction in V d d may be helpful in some way, but it does actually change your speed itself to a lower value. Now, the other techniques of doing the low voltage this is essentially uh, supply is called pipelining. Since the delay increases due to scaling of VDD, we break the combinational logic and introduce a storage element. For example, these are uh, these are your uh, latches or flip flops register these are essentially this is your logic. So, you actually this is your normal you have a data coming through a register and the logic is A and B may be NAND or, or whatever functions and or planes like an FPGA or PLAs and then finally, the output is given at another frequency which clocked at F 2 or F same either non overlapping clocks or otherwise. So, you have an input output registers and you have the logic this is what normal reference is. Instead you put through a input through a register through a logic A put additional register in between A and B and do this. Now, it is quite obvious now the delay between flip flop is reduced and the because you know you have this delay is essentially governed by you know there are two flip flop delays. However, by increasing the f here please remember this is like putting in a pipeline at first data may take time to come out but once data comes in every clock cycle you have the data and therefore, one can see from here that in here you can always have after only two clock cycles in, in this case every clock cycle will have a data and since the VDD is reduced. So, your logic is going slow, but anyway it does not matter because now the data flow is governed essentially by the pipelining system and every clock you have the output this is essentially what is called throughput rate is available to you. So, one method even if you have a scaled VDD the logic should be more like a pipeline data flow. The other possibility of course, uh, if you have lower VDD you can have an extra hardware and many multiplexes to support you. Okay. You can now divide your work into number of parallel paths and every clock cycle depending on the select here one of them may come. So, this is essentially similar like pipelining, but only thing is that the data is partitioned by you and it needs a great effort to partition it equally okay, or at least the time for which this uh, select signal changes this must occur correctly in this each of them should not exceed that. 
So, essentially the critical path among them will decide the select signal here. However, each can run at its own supply voltage because at the end of the day this MUX is going to decide the throughput and therefore, again this a clock signal which is driving the select signals and therefore, uh, in paralleling also you can have a lower voltage supply and we have already said lower the voltage supply power is minimized in all three cases dynamic switch as well as leakage and therefore, you can do architectural thinking these are called ar architectural thinking either use pipelines or use parallel processing. What is the penalty you are paying? Additional hardware. So, the catch is that when you put any additional hardware can you afford it because if you if they consume power then you have the whole game lost. So, one has to worry keep finding out what is the additional power you are going to spend to reduce the net power. Okay. Uh, if any one of us are doing uh, architectural power reduction, so here is the problems which you may see in issue, issues which are related to pipeline or paralleling. There is an issue of latency, uh, latency essentially is the net delay between input to output. So, one must see to it that the for how many cycles data will not be available to you, that is the depth of your register. So, is that acceptable to you? Okay. Because you know you cannot wait for even the first data output to arrive for any length of time. So, there is some latency issue and we also know from our uh, general understanding of a system that the throughput rate and latency are somewhat related okay. and therefore, uh, when you design any circuit using either of these architectural and techniques one must take care of uh, latency as well as throughputs, throughput rate. Obviously, you are putting extra registers everywhere, you may put uh, the depth of register may not be one, may be not be one flip flop, may be more than one flip flop. In that case, uh, you have additional area and this overhead circuitry will consume power and therefore, how much one has to worry about. However, VDD is getting uh, worrisome as I say it is called technology driven scaling it is creating a problem in the, which is why this pipeline was thought of due to continuous scaling of channel lengths you are creating because threshold is I mean VDD is not scaling in the same way the electric fields are increasing velocity saturation effects are seen. Even if higher VDD is kept current would not increase quadratically rather than linearly. So, the delay almost becomes independent of uh, VDD which is very fantastic that technology scaling actually is helping you to reduce power because you can then reduce the VDD anyway. But there have to be a combi combination of uh, all kinds of technique I discussed along with pipelining and paralleling and see to it that the net power is minimized at the and at no cost of increase of delay. Uh, I just told you one of the method of reducing power. If you have a smaller swing that is 0 to VDD instead of you have you may have VDD to 0.1 volt let us say VSS is not uh, is little above then uh, one can say so for example, your level may go down 1 upon n times this is your register pipeline this is your logic then you have a driver which does not swing fully then this is uh, capacitor and then you are at the receiver end you again have n to n kind of this. Now, you can see this uh, this noise margin should be sufficient uh, it may come back to this old level to make logic b pass through register driver circuit attenuates voltage receiver amplifies back to the rail to rail and uh, it can be found that the net power reduction in the bus this is essentially used in the bus data transmissions this is essentially the bus part bus has a larger capacitance this is a, please remember i have not discussed so much but interconnect is the major worry as of now for both speed and power speed essentially because capacitance is larger so, is R is larger these days because of the technology I am using R C time constant is very high for the interconnect or the bus and because of that delay is going down. So, to improve this somehow you may and since C is larger uh, obviously, the power dissipation is larger. So, to do this low power in the bus one technique is called low reduced voltage swings. Please remember additional registers, additional driver receiver circuits how much power you consume on that, that decides whether to use this kind of structures. 
Then there is a possibility of clock gated pipeline use uh, you know enable signal to turn off clock. See after all clock is driving driving it all the time. Okay. So, when the clock is not required the clock is fed through a signal uh, an AND gate which is one input is enabled. Now, if your enable it goes 0 the clock does not work. So, essentially the logic can be held to this both input output register can be switched off when no data is ex expected to go through. The other is dynamic power reduction in proportion to duty cycle uh, how long the system is used or activity coefficient. So, if I reduce if I change if I stop working here when I am not needed then obviously, I am reducing the power. Yeah, in the next part we shall see we must whenever we do on off the major worry is what we call glitches. Okay. This may result in what we call false clocking. The there is a clock gated pipeline with further power down. So, you can have this enable signal coming through a p channel gate uh, enable bar coming here and all this power supply voltage themselves can be reduced. As I said you this is like a sleep transistor a voltage drop there is a lower V D D made available to you power down V D D is V D D virtual here and enable of course, will stop the signal as if enable bar is 0 enable is 1 it is like an active mode with lower V D D okay. and when enable is 0 enable bar is 1 this is switched off and the full logic is off. So, essentially uh, you disconnect the logic from power supply when the clock is off eliminates the leakage as because the sleep transistor is very large it is a p channel device leakage is very small and because of that one sees that the leakage power also goes down. So, it reduces the net power. The next of course, is now this what I just discussed by uh, put the register in between uh, the advantage I am saying clock frequency stays the same in the case of uh, pipeline driven voltage scaling reduce voltage to meet relaxed frequency constraints increase clock load offsets power reduction somewhat can't pipeline beyond a single grid granularity this is a re requirement, but uh, this is how one can probably use pipelining you cannot have too long a too long depths of a pipeline because and then the delay will never be correct the latency will be very very large. Okay. Now, the last part of this power which is not really last last, but one may be we are talking now the power dissipation in a CMOS circuit an example is taken from a VLSI design conference and other conference papers through V D Agrawal's professor V D Agrawal's group at uh, Auburn University and uh, these slides are provided by him to me. Of course, they are probably available on website as well. Okay. You can go google at name V D Agrawal or Vishwani Agrawal and probably you may get some of those. A typical CMOS uh, charging discharging transient is shown here and we see dynamic power is because of charge discharge, but even if this transistor is on or off uh, if this is 0 or this is high uh, there is a static current going through it initially at least and during that uh, this device has to supply current here and here sorry here and here same way discharge has to come through here. So, the net power dissipation we discussed so far if going from 0 to 1 transition is uh, C L V D D square F 0 to 1, then short circuit current is time for what short circuit occurs V D D into I peak into F going from 0 to 1 at what times and finally, of course, the leakage uh, when the device so called is switched off and this is really not off. So, the leakage power and uh, in old technologies of 0.25 this what I said you 75 percent dynamic power 20 percent in short circuit power and only 5 percent in leakage power and I have shown you earlier some table which shows in 32 nanometer node this is becoming 60 percent or 70 percent of the power and this is 30 percent. So, now one is worry about because if this power increases what do we do, but that apart which we have already seen how to reduce leakage power. However, the worry which is not so in so much shown in the dynamic power is right now this issue. Here is a circuit you know some uh, unnecessarily transition is essentially called glitch 
if you have the circuit, if you have a logic, which we this probably if you are remember, I already discussed these issues, particularly in the case of uh, in the case of logical effort, equal delay system. Uh, but if in case there are no equal delays between this and this, one can see uh, there will be a one additional transition occurring here, which may result in a longer long output and long out. Uh, you need not have a uh, actually switching over, but it may switch, and this may lead this switching may occur, which is not expected, and that may lead to as high a power consumption as much as about 30 to 70 percent, and this glitch power is actually a coming up now very very much essentially because uh, your frequency of operation is going to gigahertz and the smallest line delays itself can actually cause the glitches. Please remember these are after all the metal lines and uh, line delays different lengths of metal lines or poly lines can create the del self delays and that may give a huge glitch power. Now, these are some papers which Vishwani Agrawal has stated about. So, one can go and look at those this. Their essential effort was uh, for optimization of cell based design, uh, how to improve the cell selection etcetera etcetera for low power switch glitch powers. Okay. So, this is their earlier work. Okay. This sheets you can always collect uh, as you will have that. So, this is essentially techniques which are available in this. You can see here the redesign all gates uh -huh, glitch is suppressed when the inertial delay of gate exceeds the differential input delays. So, redesign all gates in the circuit for inertial delay which is greater than the differential delay. If you do that, that is essentially what this is a old paper which is available in Wales R design conference. So, it is called filtering effect. Okay. So, as I said there is a already prior work done by many others including Vishwani. You have the method is objective function minimize some of the buffer delays inserted, objective minimize net delay for all buffers j, glitch removal constraint d g should be greater than t g minus small t g for all gates g, maximum delay constraint is greater than maximum delay should be smaller than the net propagation delay. Therefore, new transistor sizing and procedures are to be used. We can see you can do cell cell optimization as they are suggested. Uh, transistor sizing can be again multiple driving strengths, balance rise and fall times, power optimized by minimum parasitic capacitances. Of course, there is a discrete set of varieties possible. You create the different cells which can give you options then in the case of normal design. And then you know particularly the cells are not very circuit specific for all the possible hardware not possible number of cells available may not be sufficient. So, that may be large cost. New glitch removing solutions balance the differential delay that cell inputs itself which is called feed through cells, automate the delay element generate and inserts into the circuits and if do you do this then probably a glitch can be minimized. And this is typically a flow uh, design flow which they are suggested. We start with design entry, we do technology mapping, remove glitches by the techniques which we are suggested and then go for the layout. Resisted feed through cell generation fully automated scalable to any IC size, layout generation of modified netlist can use any place to place root tool. So, this is essentially a work from a computer science persons they want to actually not play so much with the technology since that is available whatever available to you on the spice or any other models available. So, given a design entry can we do still glitch power reduction and this is the or at least create the cells IPs for different uh, such uh, requirements for drive currents and this, but having equal delays at least differential equal delays. So, that the glitches are minimized. The last, but not the least, maybe I have many more things, maybe I will quickly go into this. The new structure of a MOSFET, which has appeared in last 10, 15 years is called FinFET, which is essentially the new MOSFET, which is going to be used in almost every low power circuit. Uh, the slides, which I am presenting to you here is from courtesy of Neeraj K. Jha at Princeton University. Of course, these slides are available on uh, web page I trust, but anyway Jha being our good old friend from the VLSR design conference, 
was kind enough to give me many years ago. So, I am first time showing you here. So, what is the motivation? The traditional view of CMOS power consumption active mode uh, which is called dynamic mode which includes dynamic switching and short circuit plus glitching and the last is the standby mode which is the leakage power. The problem as all of us have just seen that active mode power is 40 percent even at 70 nanometer bulk CMOS uh, 60 percent is really going to the leakage power. This is essentially due to the old paper of 2002 by Shiva Kao at General Kasun. So, what is the techniques? For the leakage that is standby, sleep transistor we have just talked, clock gating we have seen, uh, we can have leakage vector applications, glitching of course, we shall see later. Interfere with disable SS switch off switch on possibilities in circuit operation and uh, do not address active mode leakages, do not play too much about this, you know during active mode do not try to play VTs or anything on the leakage, because during that mode let higher current be possible. Uh, active mode circuit optimization will include gate sizing, multiple VDD to threshold ratios. We have both multiple VDD and multiple threshold, I already discussed all of them. Respect circuit operations and timing constraints can be used to reduce active mode leakage. Okay. So, we can have now techniques in which this, however, uh, this assumes a standard power uh, uh, standard transistor which is a normal N channel or a channel MOSFET or CMOS in general case what we are used so far. What opportunities therefore, uh, a typical structure called FinFET over a normal MOSFET? A FinFET is a device which is characteristics can be leveraged for low power design. The static threshold voltage control through back gate bias as we could do in normal DVS kind of techniques. Area efficient design through merging of parallel transistors. This is another feature of FinFET that you can have reduced area compared to multiple MOS transistors, normal transistors. Independent control of FinFET gates, either you can have connecting all the gates or you can have independent control and you can have therefore, different novel circuit design opportunities. So, this is how FinFETs were thought as replacement for normal MOSFET and we believe that they can also be have. Uh, since your threshold can be con uh, this area efficiency can be done, capacitance can be minimized, one probably can have low power design using FinFETs. Uh, here is some uh, typical up to say 32 nanometer case, uh, you have a say like bus bulk CMOS and you are non silicon nano devices which may come into 10 nanometer, you are still away from here. Many things are tried here, but as I am the strongest supporter of silicon next 30 years we are with silicon come what may. So, let us look this, to reach this uh, we are still a gap. So, what can be done? Uh, DG FETs can be used to fill this gap, instead of bulk CMOS you have the double gate or multiple gates as FinFETs as they call. DG FETs are extension of CMOS, manufacturing process is same as CMOS. The key limitations of CMOS scaling address through better control of channel from transistor gates, reduce short channel effects, better ion to IF. One thing we had I discussed for a good high performance circuit is higher on, of, on to off ratio of currents, this is possible. And of course, because of the variety of parameters under your control now, additional parameters, the sub threshold slope can be improved, which essentially will reduce the leakage power. And uh, one can probably get away from the problems of dopant fluctuations as they occur in the normal MOSFETs. There are structures, this is called planar DGA MOSFET, this is called uh, multiple uh, fin, fins connected which is called FinFET and there is also same structure in the vertical mode possible is called vertical DG MOSFET. These are standard figures. A typical fin type DG MOSFET can be shown here to you to show two size. Uh, this is your, please remember this is your gate and these are your source strains. These are two sources and back side are two drains. If you see this figure, this is your gate which is shown here. This is your source and this is your drain contacts to this. Now, this is one FET. Now, one can see from here why we say it is double gate, because one can have control from the this side, this side and the top side. 
So, the channel in this is not only this is the channel length, okay, but even the channel width which may act like a uh, transistor for this kind of uh, this. So, we have now as if additional control possible there is a gate here, there is a gate here and there is a gate on the top. So, essentially you have a double gate. Okay. So, one can see if you have an independent control this gate and this gate have separate biases possible when we say it is called I g gate I g fin fit. Both gates are fit can be independently controlled and therefore, requires an of course, you need an extra process step. This is called back gate and this is called the front gate okay. and in between is the oxide thickness this is your source drain. Okay. Please remember this is called thickness of this here is called the fin thickness thickness of green line here is essentially called silicon fin okay, and that is most important that is why it was named fin fit. Okay. In the case of fin fit these are number of fin fit you can actually connect all gates like this shown here. So, this will become a common gate one single gate structure this is called S g fin fit single gate. If you have independent control then you say I g f, uh, uh, f fin fit okay, or I g fin fit. Typically, if you all connect, the num depends on how many such infants are there. N fins will have two times n. Please remember, H is the height of this, this because that's where the channel is going to form. So, width of the channel is two times n. N means one, two, three here. Channel width in a fin fit is quantized. Width quantization is a design if the fine control or transistor strength is needed. Now, this certainly very helpful in having a good memory. Actually, we shall we will not look into this in this course. Here are four possible structures shown here one is single gate, other is independent gate, and one can see from here, here in the normal single gate fin fits, the back gate bias is connected to the gate itself, and this is a standard NAND gate. Since the fin fit, we can have lower leakage current because of the we can also normal single gate we do not have control, but in the case of low power this you may have a separate power supply for the gates uh, for the back bias substrates okay, like sorry for both p channel we have a high voltage here pull up bias voltage this is pull down bias voltage which is uh, one can be forward bias other can be reverse bias and one can adjust the threshold of this one can adjust the threshold of this and therefore, can and one can have some clock going on this. So, when in active mode they behave normally in an off mode they increase V t so much that the leakage currents goes down. So, similar technique was tried in the case of independent gates and either of these four techniques have been tried uh, for the implementation of NAND gates it becomes very difficult in the case of very complex logic to use the uh, IG mode gates because the connection connectivity is too many places. However, this has been tried and this is one of the major technique of reducing the low power uh, circuit uh, reducing low power in the newer circuits of below say 32 nanometer nodes. This is a comparison for ISG LP IG IG LP. Uh, just to get you an idea very low leakage current 85 nano amps. Okay. In the case of SG very high leakage because you are connecting gate to the um, substrate. So, 1 micro amp whereas, in the case of independent gate LP you have larger than this. However, because the width is very small comparatively uh, and disadvantage of course, is low leakage not so low, but this is very very low leakage. So, now you can see the speed of a circuit essentially can be better with SG. It also gives you the SG's version with low power can give you better leakage. However, many other switch capacitance analog circuits or any other blocks can be best attained for low power using IGLP. Okay. You can have higher or lower leakage depending on you if you match the pull up or pull down. So, there are advantages disadvantages in SG and this. Please remember SG has the worst thing is that it has normal SG has very high leakage, but LP version of this has a however, once as soon as you say low leakage the speed has gone down for a fin fit. So, depending on only low power 
only high performance or a standby, one of the possible combinations can be chosen. This is typically what I am trying to show you. Red shows the delay and green shows the power. So, one, this is only shown for SG kind single gate. Uh, you adjust your back gate bias with a low power and in that case one can see this is the back gate bias as you increase it the leakage goes down, but if you increase it the delay also rises. So, now you can adjust some way how much back gate bias, how much uh, leakage, how much delay or speed you want and correspondingly tailor your biases so that the on current to off current ratio is of your choice correspondingly and the low power the power is minimized. Uh, there are variety of uh, challenges in fin fed based circuit design, uh, it is no comprehensive circuit level comparisons are available, there are not enough tools to control uh, design tools available at the higher levels, there are not enough standard cells available so that you can synthesize for optimal or suboptimal operations. Fin fed width quantization is based on solving a complex integer uh, convex integer formulation which uh, though I solved it very simply, but it is not so. It is extremely complex, so you do a lot of uh, variability issues also with an adds to it, it becomes extremely complex and it does not uh, as I say handle all logic styles. You cannot have domino than every other uh, style in the fin pets. However, I mean you can you can have some things and you may not have all of it. The last part quickly will go, I think it already I am running short of time, but let me finish this. One other technique of uh, reducing power is essentially coming because of the interconnect power consumption. We already have uh, if you have a system on chip okay, which is nothing but uh, with intellectual proper or intellectual property so IP. There are lot of SOPs, SOCs or IPs are getting marketed and they are normally firm and they like act like a black box. There are issues of timing, power, area to be solved for any interconnect layer of each of them. So, this particular part uh, I am going to talk about more about interconnects in an SOC or any in circuit per se. Interconnect consumes large power, 60 percent of the current processor DSP processor in particular consumes is consumed through a interconnects. So, obviously, all the techniques we discussed for the devices and all techniques of uh, architectures everything they were valid only for device performance, device related performance, but if the power is additional to those is coming more from the interconnect one should worry more about the interconnect power. So, and one of the major worry is that this is not scaling down because the RC time constants are not scaling down. So, how do you reduce the power at least the dynamic power? So, we know dynamic powers has something to do with the activity coefficient. Uh, dynamic power is alpha times uh, C V square C V D D square into F. So, can I reduce alpha which is the activity coefficient? So, what we say our goal is there to reduce number of transition on the bus. So, techniques explored in the past to reduce L d i by d t which is called switching noise on the output pads. This is of course, is always present even now L d i by d t problems cannot be easily solved, this is always be present. However, the other power reduction could be which is called bus invert coding as in the case of what we call starvation coding or limited weight coding. Now, between the there has to be trade off between reduced activity and circuit overhead. So, we say you reduce alpha and to do this if you put additional circuit to do that how much is the power on the additional circuit. So, overhead is what most important you need extra wires to do this. So, additional power on the bus encoding circuitry can be complicated sometimes and decoding is also equally complicated and it may consume large power sometimes. And, uh, one has to worry about this power, low power interconnect. A typical bus can be modeled into a LCR circuit like a transmission line. In our the kind of model which I am showing you is uh, something one of my student in 90s or two, 2000 time has worked on. Compar a similar model has been chosen by many people and they say 
a typical between the two lines of a bus there will be a capacitance and uh, between between the bus and each ground there will be a uh, substrate capacitance. So, this is the each this is one bus e each line in a bus. So, there is a capacitance between the wires and there is a capacitance of a wire to the substrate. So, there is something called lateral and horizontal capacitance vertical capacitances this is called C s and this is called C c. So, we say uh, energy is half y times C c x times C s times V d square this. Now, what are this x and y uh, how many sections we have is deciding that. So, this is the energy. So, let us see how do I reduce the energy reduction. If we reduce V d d then we can reduce the energy. So, what I do is use Hamming codes. If you use reduce V d d and use Hamming codes this can be reduced by y c c c V d d square f c shunt capacity use current sensing. So, I have different techniques you do bus invert coding you get this power. So, you adjust only x reduce y use alternate bus invert coding. So, you can see either reduce y reduce x reduce this f c is not controlled because if you control f c then your speed goes down. So, I am now I am only interested in transition to c c transition to c s power supply. So, de depends on I can do coding on the data arriving on a bus and when we may use different methods to actually reduce the power. So, particularly I am interested in reduction in x and y. So, different techniques we are suggested in literature and if you what many people do if you only do V d d scaling then we say it is you, they use Hamming codes we shall see what they are. If you do shunt capacitance this you say bus invert for x this alternate bus invert for reduce y what we have done we have used a new technique which is based on modified Huffman codes in which both x and y can be minimized and if you can minimize both in x and y the net energy lost on interconnect can be minimized further. I okay, will uh, skip this uh, because this will require lot much effort to explain, but let us look into power versus residual probability error probability. So, depending on the capacitance value this is half puff and this is say 5 puff the depends on the different kinds of coding you use uh, this is single error single event error for example, this is multiple. So, one can see from here bus transitions play a minor role in the case of lower capacitance whereas, they play a larger role if the load capacitance is very high. So, if there are larger transitions on a higher capacitance buses then you have large power lost. This particularly occurs in a normal codec systems where the switchings are constantly as the data goes with a very high speeds. The typical idea in bus invert code is to uh, is simple invert all wire values say if you have 1 you make it 0. Okay. So, it is called bus invert. Now, what is that advantage? The advantage of bus invert is the assumption is that if the data is coming and the last data is let us say on a one wire there is a 0. So, the next data should come 0 then there is no transition, but the next bus should also should not should have one which must receive one again. So, there are no transitions. So, the coupling as well as this if I change it I probably feel that at least one of them will be reduced transitions. Okay. And in that case for a particular data I will have lesser number of transitions. So, this is what essentially bus invert does. In the case of alternate bus invert we actually see odd and even bit wires dealt separately explicitly. So, how do we find this? So, the better method I may give you the very simple technique. Okay, here is the one what is essentially the way we are doing it. What we do is we figure out how many ones and how many zeros are in a data. The difference between them is called the Hamming distance, uh, number of 1s minus number of zeros. Once you know the, your Hamming distance, that is how many they differ, and if the Hamming distance is larger than n by 2, then you must invert extra invert signal equal to 1 and put inverted next data on the bus, okay, so that the transitions are minimized. If the else you put invert to 0, 
that is whether to change the data on the wires. If you find the hemming distance is less than n by 2, what does that mean? Zeros are larger. Okay. If the zeros are larger, you do not invert them because anyway you will require zeros more zeros to available no transition. So, you actually prefer to have those. So, every time first figure out that means there must be a circuitry which must find the hemming distance for each data arrival from the last data to new data how much is the new hemming distance and correspondingly give invert signals whether to wire should be inverted or non invert code it like that. Once you code it you pass through data on a line and at the end you decode it so that the original data is stored okay. and that is essentially what is called bus invert technique. Here yeah, this is a graph shown here this is called effective transitions versus the uh, ratio of C C to C B. You can see if C S is 0 uh, here C C is 0 means B is 0, B is 0 means C C upon C S plus C B. So, C C upon coupling capacitor divided by the substrate capacitance plus net capacitance if I say is called B. Please remember I am again saying C C that is the coupling capacitance between wires divided by the net capacitance which is C C plus C substrate. So, at this point uh, C C is 0, C C is 0 and here C C is 1 means C S is 0. So, for the 3 cases this is uncoded. So, you can see large activity. Okay. If you do not code it, if you do alternate bus coding it is something like this A B I. If you do original bus invert coding which is the triangle this is this is lower than this red is A B I A, as is implemented. Okay. If you this is of course, actually implemented this is the theoretical one finds the red one is what is most important. So, one can see from uncoded to the coded implemented this is theoretically one feels that A B I will should be better when the C C is roughly half equal to C B, but this is not true if we figure it out this is anyway increasing this is theoretical evaluations we did and we implemented it on a simulated actual hardware. Then we figure out alternate bus invert coding actually reduces the uh, from 1 to 0.75 to 0 0.8. Okay. It is increasing, but not very much. So, is alternate bus invert is uh, uh, sorry, so is this original bus invert coding, but it is still le le it is higher than alternate bus invert. So, now I say the best transition is that you do alternate bus invert coding correspondingly for, for almost any interconnect and you may have activity coefficient reduced. Now, the problem is as there is a uh, redu uh, maximum number of transition therefore, reduced from n to n by 2 assuming uniform and independent bits peak dynamic power is therefore, cut off to half. But with invert coding n by 2 becomes most likely Hamming distance. So, the inverting data values makes no difference n gets bigger average power saving becomes smaller and larger than that the saving is lower because the other power starts increasing. Scheme optimal for overhead one extra wire is also required to create invert uh, signal. We suggested another uh, technique which is this is a uh, you can go into probability theory of information theories uh, on this area. Uh, one of the very famous code of data transmission is called based on probability of occurrence of alphabets is called Huffman's code. S is called the symbols, this is probability, this is the code which it creates. Code is not unique, we can allot 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 to each alphabets. However, this number keeps rising, one you can see the number of bits rising as you increase the symbols. What we did, we have actually truncated that to only 3 bits, which is called modified Huffman's code. We actually applied it to a standard buses, we have compared our result with this. For a typical ARM processor with a memory uh, on with the bus length going from in a cache from say this much to this much in millimeters one can see this is roughly this is uh, cache bus and this is memory bus 20 this is large enough you feel it, but this is essentially in an ARM processor we have actually. So, green blue one essentially is normal instructing bus encoding this is address bus encoding and uh, uh, A B I is which is what is shown here which is what we have tried. Okay. 
and uh, using our Huffman's code and we, we figured out that we can actually minimize for any length of buses the power uh, activity coefficient or energy reduction is almost 5 to 10 percent more in maybe uh, 6 percent less I mean more reduction on an average in our codes. The last but not the least one of the simplest technique which initially everyone tries in a sequential data stream is to go gray coding. Okay. Only one wire out of n transition in any given cycle is on extra circuit only changing you know in gray code only one bit changes. So, if you have a data con converted to gray codes only one wire out of n transitions in any given cycle will change extra circuits and extra areas are therefore, required useful for address traces which tends to be sequential like say program counter, FIFO pointers, indices for arrays and stored in a RAM these may be useful and many of the sequential final state machines to set the states uh, you require state transitions there at that time may be use gray codes. Mix of gray code and uh, humming code by based bus invert probably can do both random and sequential traces uh, power reduction and one can have low power circuits. At the end of the day in conclusions uh, one can reduce for any design of a processor optimization at algorithm level you can have transformation for filters like glitch can be reduced modification and coefficients you can do lot of things in algorithm itself. So, that the amount of computation itself is minimized. At the architectural level, you do architectural level voltage scaling, minimize the transition using coding just now I discussed, adder input bit swaps which I will discuss arithmetic later. So, we will show you. Minimize glitch as much as possible by equalizing the delays. At the layout level and the logical level, place and route optimization bus bit ordering, you do all low voltage support circuitry, logic level power down and gated clocks can be used if all the techniques discussed by me are applied one can design a low power uh, processor uh, which requires all kinds of architectures all kinds of circuits in different architectures and can have a low power. Uh, please remember one of the major effort all across the world right now is to create a very very low power uh, processor the arm has one, one of them or maybe intel is also having in some tablets. So, we are trying to reduce the power because this iPads or tablets everyone wants to have extremely low power circuits. Uh, many of them are not very high performance circuits, but some of some part are high performance. So, you need to control threshold for those architecture parts. However, overall the effort is to create a low voltage low power processors and all my such techniques which I discussed with you so far can lead to uh, such designs. Some of my graduate student who helped me in this long time are stated here Mande Pandey and Bhimara were my PhD students. There are many MTech students which are not listed main they, those who are directly worked with me on the uh, low power area are listed here Saurabh Banglani, Agashi, Saula Rai Chaudhary, Gurvinder, Sri Hari Bama, Kapil Jain. Ragunandan, Gulwani, Pamoria, Mahaj and many others. I, I have forgotten some of them. I apologize if their names are missing here. And thank you. Uh, these are some of the references which uh, I will be providing to you. The three books which uh, I may actually advise a uh, few books for this low power design you may like to have is low voltage low power IC, ICs and system I am short shorting the names ICs and systems by E Sanchez his full name is I think Sinensico or something Sinensico I do not know exactly but maybe Sinensio okay. this is one book this is the name low voltage low power ICs and systems. The I think the other author is Andreas I am not sure, but just check Andreas something something. 
The second is again low voltage, low power ICs, uh, VLSI systems, VLSI subsystems. by K Y E O and Kaushik Roy from Purdue University. Third book which is very popular is Digital IC Design Perspective. by very famous people, very best textbook for VLSI design, basic VLSI design which in my first course I discuss is by J M Rebe, Anand Tashri, Anand K H Chandrakasan from MIT, this is from Berkeley, Chandrakasan from MIT and the third author is B Nikolik from Berkeley. And fourth, which is one of my most standard book, which I keep using in my VLSI design is CMOS VLSI design and system etcetera by Ashrangian, Ashrangian and Neil West. If you use these four books, most of the thing which I discussed, this last two will give you the basics of power design or power consumptions and how this. Then of course, number of papers which I gave you will give you the actual details of the things which I showed in this work. And we can see why power reduction is becoming so very relevant in the present era. Thank you for the day.